Hey, in this episode of Franchise Secrets, I have Anne Markovecchio with GoGlow. She is their first franchisee, and GoGlow is one of our portfolio brands. Uh, History is franchisee with European Wax early on, had a good exit there, and currently with My Salon Suites, which is a great salon suite brand. Many of my friends are franchisees there, but she chose her third brand. Diversification was one of her main reasons. And there were multiple other reasons, but we get into things like why, when should you diversify? Why diversify? Things that she looked at as she chose her third brand, why she's been successful as a franchisee, how she left corporate America in the first place, which is, um, I think a lot of people that are buying franchises for the first time resonate with, uh, with that part of the conversation. But we talk about founders, why founders are so important to an emerging brand, what it's like to be first to market, second to market, third to market, because she's she's seen it. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Anne. Representing Franchise Secrets, Eric Von Horn. And welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I've been uh, looking forward to having you on. You uh, were the first franchisee of Go Glow, which is one of our portfolio brands at Front Street Equity Partners. And then when I heard about you going through the process from Bobby Brennan, my partner over there, he's like, Eric, she's you know, has experience with uh, EWC, European Wax, currently with My Salon Suite, and um, and now GoGlo. And so I'm like, we've got to have her on to kind of hear her story because both of those brands, uh, your first brands are great brands. And I kind of hate to say it because I'm a Sola salon guy. Like that's, I'm right. Sola through and through. I but sure. I know My Salon Suite is a fantastic brand as well. So- Anyway, let's get started. How did you, like, tell us about you in corporate America. What were you doing in corporate America um, before franchising? Great. So I spent 23 years in corporate America working for some large software companies. Um, The last nine years of my career, I spent in sales at LinkedIn, which definitely was an amazing experience. So I was one of the first 19 folks in the Chicago field sales office. And so when I started there, LinkedIn was not what it is today. A lot of people didn't even know about social media. They didn't know about LinkedIn. And really, our goal was just to get a bunch of folks to join the network. Um, So we were constantly going around doing presentations around the country, why you should be on LinkedIn, the value that it offers. And then, you know, I was part of the sales team that sold our recruiting tools, the tools that Fortune 500 companies and various organizations across the world used to recruit top talent. So what year was um, that? What year were you at in uh involved with LinkedIn? I doing started that recruiting? in May, May of 2010. Okay. So that's probably um I knew how long had LinkedIn been around before 2010? Do you know roughly? A few years. Yep. So I remember I remember sitting in Virginia Beach working for Liberty Tax Service, selling franchises there. And I'm like, yep. there's this thing called LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And nobody knew about it there. And I don't know where I heard about it, but I'm like, this thing's great. So I started to like look at people's backgrounds on there. And if I could find a candidate that was actually on there, I could find out some information about them before I was having conversations with them. And that was way back when, but I totally remember that. Um, sitting in the office, discovering LinkedIn for the first time. And boy, did that thing uh, blow up. How long yes. were you with them? Um, so I left in February of 2019 to run my franchise <laughs> businesses full time. So again, it was an incredible experience. I had amazing managers. I worked with some of the smartest people. I still believe some of the smartest people in the world work for that company today. Um, and they still possess some of the best data out there. So I will always bleed LinkedIn blue. <laughs> and I am forever grateful to Wade Burgess and David Cohen who hired me way back when because they certainly changed the trajectory of my career. Isn't that amazing? You look back and you can see these points in your career, your life that 
totally changed where you are today because of meeting somebody, because of getting a chance uh, that getting someone ch- gave you or yes. making a specific decision to go a different direction. So I look back at my life too, and I'm like, man, I'm grateful for certain people because it's such impact on my life and gave me chances when nobody else gave me chances. So I love hearing Absolutely. you say that. Thank you. And now it's time to pay it forward. And that's one yeah. of the many reasons why I wanted to get involved in what I'm getting involved in today. Well, tell us your first brand and franchising was uh, European Wax. And I know I have friends that uh, were area developers there are still involved in that brand as franchisees. And mm-hmm. I hear so many great things about that brand. Every brand has its challenges. Every brand has its challenges. But I hear so many good things. So tell us about how you got involved in your first brand of EWC. Absolutely. So um, EWC hit the Chicagoland market sometime around 2013. I received a mailer that said, hey, we're opening this <laughs> this new center. Come try us out. Waxing for free. And I thought, ah, this is too good to be true. Like what? So I was you know, going to my local salon to get waxed. Um, I have very sensitive skin. So I'm like, this just can't be right. But so anyway, I took you know a chance. I went into the center. It was beautiful. It was clean. Got my free wax. I walked out and I said, wow, this is a game changer. So I called my friend who was then my business partner and um, both he and I had talked about, you know, getting out of corporate America at some point, but how were we going to make as much money as we were making with our corporate jobs? So this was kind of our escape from corporate America plan. Um, There was only one other center, the center that I went to in Naperville, Illinois, in Illinois at the time. So we actually opened the second center in Illinois in Orland Park. So So, it it really took off. So back then, how many, do you know roughly how many locations there were? Of- there was a handful in Florida, a handful in other markets like Texas and Florida, the markets that would be the obvious places, um, but just a handful of stores. You so know, the, you the, were the really Cobos, early on. Yeah, the Cobos were still involved, the family that developed it. Did you feel, looking back, did you realize how new it really was when you bought? Yes. You did. But I didn't know the importance of that. <laughs> And so now what I've learned, what I've learned, and especially the things that I've learned from you and uh, the folks at Front Street Equity Partners and all the folks that you have on your podcast. It's, yeah, when you get involved in the merging brand, it definitely has its set of challenges. I just, you know, as I hear your story, you got involved with two great brands. Now your third, it's going to be the greatest one. But, you know, really, I mean, you picked your first two that you opened up as really great brands. So, how long, um, you're not with EWC anymore. You had an exit. So give us give us kind of like what happened from the time that you bought, you grew it to X amount, and then you had a, you sold it. Right. So I was a part, partner in four stores. Um, we had the four locations in Illinois. Um, I sold my shares back to my then business partner in October of 2021. Attention, franchisors and franchisees, there are two really important resources that I want to share with you that will help you avoid costly mistakes and increase your enterprise value. The first is our free Facebook group. It's a community that has over 4,000 franchisees and franchisors in it. When somebody asks a question, they get honest and authentic answers from multiple perspectives. You can join the group for free over at franchisesecrets.com forward slash Facebook. The second resource I want to share with you is if you're a franchisee and you want to be around a community of successful Z's and other brands and in other industries, this is why I created the Franchisee Mastermind. If you want access to the best single and multi-unit owners to know what they're doing, or if you want to be around other multi-brand owners, then you'll want to check out my Franchisee Mastermind. The reason why people join is they want access to my Rolodex, my connections, to each other, They want a shortcut success, both short-term and long-term. Links will be in the show notes or at scalablefranchise.com. And I tell you, that was a good exit financially. Absolutely, it was, yes. Because I invested all that into my salon suite. So then you took that money and then you rolled that into your next brand, which was my salon suite. So what, like, why, how... 
how quickly did you buy your next brand after the sale? Or were you already I'm looking sorry. at your next brand? I was already involved with my salon suite when I sold my okay. share to EWC. So tell me about- so We haven't heard a store built yet, but I was working on it. Okay. So, um, because I think this is interesting to franchisors out there that want to have franchisees like you, that have experience in franchising, that have had success in franchising. So I think um, this conversation is interesting to franchisors that really would want to attract the ands of the world that come that have a successful background in franchising. I also think for people that are first time into franchising, they're wanting to get into it and buy their first franchise, or maybe they're wanting to buy their second or third brand. This will be a really helpful conversation. So why what you had experience in one brand, franchising was a success. How did you find my salon suites and 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 end up buying that one? So it actually popped up in our hometown. One of the other franchisees here in Michigan built a store in my hometown in Northville, Michigan, and I saw it and I'm like, what is that? Was that my buddy Dan and Craig and Hillary? It was not them. Um, wasn't it was, them? And it, unfortunately not. No, it was one of the other franchisees um, here in the Michigan area. So I looked it up online and then I started doing my research and then I submitted my information. And as I said earlier, I'm all about paying it forward and helping invest in others as others have invested in me. So I saw this as an opportunity to take my entrepreneurial experience and spirit and help these beauty professionals own their own business. So as you know, with your experience, there's coaching, there's a lot of things that these folks need help with. And I've really enjoyed doing that. And I've watched them soar and it's been so rewarding. So what do you think about the competition out there? You got, like I was yeah. saying earlier, I'm Sola. Sola was my brand. We had 12 of them in Orange County. Mm -hmm. I have good friends of mine, really good friends of mine that like the Tomasellos, they're right. some part of the mastermind. They've been friends for years mm -hmm. with, um, and they own in Florida. And then like, you know, my friends in, in Michigan and, and I have friends in California that were in markets, the same markets as me in a competing brand of Phoenix. So like, what's, what do you, how do you view competition? Cause I was friends with all of those guys. We were competitors, we were friends and I have a lot of really good things to say, especially about my salon suite. So give me your, your thoughts on competition and having, you know, just exploring that. Sure. So there's competition in any business. It's all how you position yourself. It's all how, for me personally, how I treat the folks that run from me, how I help invest with them, how I'm involved with them, if they need and want me to be involved, um, how we keep the places clean, you know, the services that we offer. So for instance, my salon suite has a partner, a partnership with Square. You know, we get lower processing rates, online booking. There's all these other things that the franchise is bringing to the table to uh -huh. the members. Um, that we offer to provide them a business in a box so they can, you know, jumpstart their new business successfully. Two different brands now, kind of different stages. I would yes. say EWC uh -huh. is, was a pioneer in yeah. what they were doing. Like they're kind of first to market. Yep. And they're, and, and they're, they've had other ones that have come along um, after them or maybe alongside of them. Uh -huh. My salon suites, I would say, is not first to market. Correct. So you followed in the footsteps of Sola <laughs> and maybe some of the others in terms of the their growth. Mm -hmm. um, what do you what's what do you see as the difference between being first to market uh, versus second to market? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, the offering that my son suite brings to the table is very different than the other brands out there. So even though we were not first to market, there's other things that we offer that are heck of a lot more attractive. So again, like there's competition in every business, but it's all how you position yourself. And so yeah, I, think I think that that's so. really important. Um, I've noticed that with brands that, you know, we get involved with at Front Street, one of our portfolio brands is not first to market. Um, uh -huh. And they are probably second to market. Um, talking about Magnolia Soap and Bath, they're probably second to market behind a large competitor and second to market for sure behind a non-franchised competitor. But you have, a, but you can you can learn from what first to market the first to market brand has done, and you can tweak things, improve things, and whatnot. I say, go glow. Where would you where would you say go glow is um, in 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 the in the market position right now? 
Well, I think it's first to market because yep. it's very different than other any other spray tan service out there. And I can say that being an avid spray tanner for the last, geez, I've been doing this since like 2007. So mm-hmm. it's not even comparable to anything that's out there today. So uh, let's talk about let's talk about that because um, you are a franchisee now with uh, Go Glow, and mm-hmm. Melanie's a founder there. I remember having that first conversation with Mel, and she's telling me about her brand. I'm just like, just don't get it. I don't. I don't. I've never had a spray tan. I don't think. I. I, I don't think ever. Well, I'll never say never because my man Bobby gets them out there sometimes when when he's forced to. And we tease him about it for sure, um, but but there is a men's market there. But I've just never been that customer. Um, and so Mel came into my mastermind, and um, I got to know her. And then um, I said, Jeff, this is a very interesting brand because we got kind of the inside look at things. We're like, this is super interesting. So we fly down there to Minnesota in the dead of winter. Well, the dead of winter. It's cold like it is in South Dakota. And um, in and out, same day, in and out. We arrive, spend all day there, just going deep dives into everything. And we left and we were on the way to the airport and we're just like, we really like this brand. We would love to have the opportunity to have uh, GoGlo as a portfolio brand at Front Street. Um, but um, what would you, what attracted you to it? Cause for us, it was the founder. It was a unit economics. It was the brand. Yeah. There was so many different things uh, about it, but you're sitting in a different seat than I am because you know, the industry a little bit, what sure. first attracted you to your third brand? So first of all, I had been listening to your podcast for a very long time and I heard the podcast with Mel and I thought, wait a minute, she's from Minneapolis. I grew up there Two, I spray tan all the time. What's the difference between her spray tan and the spray tans I've been getting? So I was taking in all that information and then put in, you know, submitted my information to be contacted. So why did I do this? I learned about diversifying my portfolio from you and all the other folks that you've had on the podcast. And I was looking for another challenge outside of what I had going on currently. And um, it took me a minute to get there, but this came to me at the right time. So it's GoGlo is so different than any other spray tan for lots of different reasons. So number one, as I mentioned, I've been doing this forever. When I pretty much do this weekly in the summertime. So first of all, I'm an undercover redhead. I'm as pale as <laughs> me. I cannot physically get tan. And I've had skin cancer multiple times at one time that had to result in plastic surgery. So like the sun and I don't get along. So being spray tanned is huge to me. So when I go once a week in the summer, my husband would hit the door at the house here from coming home from work and it would say to me, you went and got spray tan today, didn't you? And I said, oh, I did. And he goes, I can smell it. Oh. So the GoGo spray does not smell. Um, it lasts so much longer. Um, the pre-care and the post-care, all those products are a game changer. So the way that it develops on your skin, you know, the organic aspect of it, there was no question, especially after I engaged with Mel and team, that I wanted in on this because this is changing the way people will spray tan moving forward. So even, I think it's important for buyers out there and franchisors, it's so easy to think you know what a why somebody says they're different. And I'll hear people talk to Mel and say, what's different about it? I go, I get a spray tan. What's different about it? How how come it's better? And um, and and she's like, Eric, it's way better. And then I start talking to people like you that have had an experience like it and have seen it and experienced it. And, they, and you're just like, it's way better. I get it. And so that's one of the things that Jeff and I, when we're out visiting with her, we just heard people talk about that. And we started to started to believe it. Thank God we did and just didn't rely on our own, you know, uh, <laughs> own beliefs, having never gotten a spray tan before. So Eric. like, what is it? Why do people originally, like initially not really get it, not really understand how different it is? Do you have so, any comments on that? Absolutely. So, you know, most women and men will go to a crazy place to get tanned. So whether it's by a machine robotically and some used to be a spray, you know, like a uh, tanning place with beds, 
and then they just can't, you know, have added these robotic machines or they'll go into somebody's basement like I do today and get spray tans. So when you walk into a GoGo boutique and it smells great, it doesn't smell like a spray tan solution. It's clean and bright and it's beautiful. Um, when you go to a spray tan place today, anywhere else other than a GoGo, there's brown stuff everywhere. It's sticky. It smells like burnt skin. It's not the same experience. So here you are going to get a tan for an event or just to make yourself feel good for a week in the summer. And you walk into this place and it's dingy and icky and you leave sticky and you smell like burnt skin. That doesn't happen at GoGo. This reminds when you said, like it's purposeful, that's white in there. And she's like, it's white because I want people to know it's clean. Like, oh, I didn't think about that. My, I was watching, um, oh, it's a Christmas movie, um, where, where they're supposed to go on vacation. They, they don't go on that vacation. Um, and, uh, Tim Allen goes in and his wife gets that spray tan and that girl's just like, that's the typical, that's what I think about it with a spray tan, a little scary, a little scary. And, and people out there, women talk about how bad their experience is getting these spray tans. But again, I have zero experience in it, but is that pretty common out there? It's so common. It's happened to me countless times. Someone so, doesn't how to apply, you know, your hands are orange, your feet are orange, it's gross. What are some of the other things that attracted you about getting into your third bag? Because I, you know, you said you wanted to diversify, which Justin <laughs> Donald and I just did a podcast and we were talking about investments and, and businesses and the importance of diversifying you focus to like create wealth uh, but to keep wealth you diversify and you know there's time and place for for everything um uh, so i love the diversification a lot of the people that we talk to where we talk to that are in my salon suites that i know that are mutual friends of ours or franchisees little franchisees with you that was a diversification play for them because yep. they've been very successful in other brands. And mm-hmm. I know it because I know these brands and I know their yep. lifestyle and it was a diversification play and they can, t- people continue to have success and they diversify. Not everything's going to turn to gold, but you've got to keep, you got to keep going. So um, diversification, like, did you look at other brands? Um, okay. See, I, this is like, this is the first time that we've spoken. Like the real audience knows, like we did not talk before. Like this is I'm I'm getting to know Anne on this call, um, and it's purposeful. So I didn't know that you looked at anything else. Like what were some of the? You don't have to name the brands if you don't want to, but what were some of the other things or industries that you looked at as you were thinking so about diversifying? I had a conversation with another one of your portfolio brands. Um, so it was outside of the beauty industry, more mm-hmm. in the sector. Um. I was thinking about doing something else above and beyond franchising. I just hadn't figured out what that was yet. So again, I was looking for a new challenge, having conversations with a lot of people, um, trying to uh, understand what my next play was going to be. And this fell into my lap, all because I stopped listening to music on the way to my salon suite locations, stopped rocking out in the car and thought to myself, you know, I had 23 years of all this experience in the tech industry. I need to educate myself more on the franchise industry. And that's how I came onto your podcast as far as listening. And that's how I found out about GoGlo. So timing is everything in life. And so I thank you again for having all these experts and all these folks involved in your world because it certainly brought me to GoGlo and to Mel. And I think it's a perfect marriage. Um, Let's talk about Mel. Uh-huh. Because you've been part of brands early on where you, I don't know about my salon suites with the, with the founders, how important they were early on, but like, give us a, give us a sense of like early into a brand and being around great founders and like, what'd you think of Mel? Yeah. So I was impressed right out of the gate. Um, I was impressed with the process. So there was a lot of discovery early on, which is really important. That was a big part of how I was taught to sell too, was discovery. So asking a lot of questions, doing a lot of listening, not a lot of talking. (laughs) So um, I was very impressed with Bobby and your team at Front Street Equity Partners. So what did I think of Mal? So I went to Minneapolis. um, We sat down. I am typically a very guarded person. 
In fact, my managers have told me over the years, like, you gotta let your guard down. Like, they're not like that. Like, once people get to know you, that's not who you are. So I've gotten better at that as I've aged, um, but I'm typically very guarded. And so that discovery day, I was not guarded at all because I feel like I didn't have to be. You know, I felt like I was part of this family already and I was all in. So leaving, she said to me, she said, Anne, I feel like an old friend of mine came home because again, I'm from Minnesota too came home to visit. And I'm so fortunate. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so fortunate too. And I feel the same way about you. So it was just like, ta-da, this is perfect. And I was totally sold on the brand, the process, the whole thing, but so impressed with her, so impressed with her grit and her story and how hard she's worked to get to where she's at today. That's the American dream. And she's realized that. So from my perspective, and again, for franchise buyers out there, this is speaking to the importance of the founder and founders. If you're wanting to get outside help, like what we do at front street, we're kind of a boutique private equity firm in franchising. And um, sometimes we just do advisory. Sometimes we do advisory and franchise sales. But one of the things that we really look at really closely is the founder. We don't fall in love with that founder. We don't think that founder has that grit, that determination. If we don't think that that founder is all in on that brand, we are out. That founder is critical. Their their focus, their um, their just all in mentality of whatever it takes, however many, however long I need to work at this, um, that's critical. The other thing with founders, again. People that are thinking about buying a franchise, this this is important. Um, try to we get to have these behind the scenes conversations with these founders, and they are franchisee focused, so franchisee focused, and that's what people going through the sales process or franchise buying process they really don't get to understand that. And if they do hear about how that founder's franchisee focused. It's hard to believe it because you just don't know until you're on the inside. And then you get to see how the decisions that they are making really is focused on the franchisee. And you you will, you probably already seen the glimmer of that, but you'll see more of that as you get deeper into GoGlow. But both of our founders uh, that are portfolio brands are very franchisee focused. And we have a couple more brands that are one probably coming on at the end of this year of 2023, another one coming in the first quarter of next year. And again, those founders are amazing because um, we talked to founders and that great unit economics, like the 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 they make money. These I can think of one specifically. They make a ton of money. This their their corporate locations, but there's something off with the founder, mm-hmm. and and sometimes we can pinpoint it, and sometimes we can't. We just know something's off, or we just don't like how they treat us, or how they treat their employees or how they treat other people that we invite to be part of these calls with us when we're going through this dating phase with founders. Okay. And if there's something off with them, it's a hard no from us because we have to live with them um, like a franchisee has to live with them. And and it's a hard no. So I think anybody out there looking at, at, um, at franchises, you've got to uh, get to know these founders if you are early in a brand. Now, if you're later in a brand, it's probably not as important because- um, the franchisees are going to be able to kind of, franchisees are probably going to give you insight that, that you wouldn't get from a founder anywhere else because, you know, the founders are probably not as active or they are, or they're not as active in the things that they are early on in a brand. So just some things to think about everyone as you are um, thinking about buying a franchise or you're a franchise or that is wanting to get help from, from a group like ours over at Front Street. Founders are key. All right. Let's, um, any comments on founders before we shift gears a little bit? No, I'm just grateful that I get to work with Mel. (laughs) She is amazing. And we are going to continue to do great things. So I feel this tells you, uh, this tells you about Mel. Um, I'm going to look up, um, she, I did a, a franchise or mastermind session today and I had two of my business partners on there that are amazing at franchise development. And we were helping out some of our franchisors there in the franchise, the franchise or mastermind. 
And by the way, if you're interested in the franchise or mastermind, just go to Scalable Franchise and you'll see it. It says two thousand dollars a month, but it's really only, um, really only a uh, five hundred a month. But we were helping these franchisors, and she sent me a and she jumped on and she said hopped on that call today. Not sure how helpful I was, but I always want to support my guys. What a huge value on the call for those learning from the best. And she just jumped on just to support us. And, <laughs> and, um, and that's, and that's absolutely who she is. She's, uh, she's amazing, but you got to find buyers. You got to find people like that. You're going to be partners with them and founders. You got to be that if you're going to have a great franchise system. Um, don't be like some of these people that we talk to that just want to get out in a year and they don't like franchisees and they, they're just burned out. Those are not, if the franchise or is burned out, run. That's, that's my advice. Any advice to people that are thinking about getting into a brand and the founders may not be amazing. And yeah, so I would run the other direction. It's again, it's a marriage. It's a partnership. You need to make sure that you're in alignment with them and their goals and ask a lot of questions. That's what that whole discovery process is about. You know, don't be afraid to ask a question that you think is a stupid question. You're investing your time and hard earned money into this brand and you have to make sure that you're in it to win it and that you believe in the offspring. What makes you such a great franchisee? Let's shift gears and talk about the franchisee side of and like what makes you a great franchisee? So I'm super motivated. I always have been, um, you know, motivated for lots of different reasons. Um, but I love the challenge that this brings to me on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. You know, there's been so many exciting things that have happened throughout my career. And this is just another chapter in my book of my career. And it's been an incredible challenge and it's really been not easy at times. Um, you know, we were shut down here in Michigan for three months during COVID. So I could cannot not collect rent from my salon professionals during that time and um, certainly wasn't able to get government loans. So, you know, you work through the tough times. So just to be clear, you probably had to continue to pay your, your Absol- landlord rent. Yeah, I did. Absolutely. And the only revenue that's coming in is your tenants paying you rent Correct. at the, at the, uh, for yep. renting their salon suite. So you are paying rent for right. the landlord, your landlord, you are not collecting rent from your tenants and, um, but you feel like you're doing the right, the right thing. For I them. was doing the right thing because they couldn't legally work. So how could I say to these folks who entrusted in me to start running their businesses under my roof, hey, guess what? You can't legally cut hair or color hair, but you have to pay me. That's not right. So we figured it out. <laughs> it worked. And the business has been better since. So, you know, everything works out for the right reasons. I believe in hard work. I believe in honesty, you know, being a moral person and, you know, having conversations about things. So, it works out. Karma has been good to me. Conversations. What are some of the, are you okay with hard, tough, Absolutely. difficult conversations or do you yeah. steer clear from them? Yeah, no, I totally am okay with tough conversations. I mean, that's what I was taught to do for 23 years in sales. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, of course. Yeah, but it's all Give about- me an example. Give me an example. Because there's- and there are people out there that are not comfortable with hard conversations and they will avoid them. I'm okay with it. Okay. Like I'm okay with conflict, but yeah. I know other people that just, they want to avoid conflict. Very smart, successful business people. A lot of them try to avoid conflict. I'm not one of those, but like, give us some examples of not avoiding conflict or just kind of your, your philosophy around it. Yeah. So life is full of conflict, just like life is full of other things. So you have to learn how to navigate it. Um, one of the big things I worked at, or I learned at LinkedIn was, you know, communicating with compassion and having a tough conversation mm-hmm. with compassion. So understanding where the other person is coming from when it comes to this conflict and not attacking that individual or that topic when you're having a conversation, asking questions, you know, working through what that conflict is. So for instance, today, I had a complaint from one of the folks who rents a suite for me that there was a smell of marijuana in the building. So, you know, coming up with a way to communicate to my team, we use an app to communicate in a very compassionate way 
not placing blame, but letting the ladies know like vaping in the ladies room is not acceptable. And here's the health rules. So let's make sure we keep it classy girls. So, you know, um, it's definitely something that you have to work on and, and continue to improve on having difficult conversations, but anyone can do it. It's just that you lead with compassion and really try to understand the other person's point of view. I laugh so hard because we had the exact same issues come up at Sola eight years ago. <laughs> it was the same thing. Oh my goodness. All right. Let's talk about the leap. Like, what was it like? How the feeling that you had uh -huh. when when you were past the point of no return from corporate, leaving LinkedIn to start your new brand, what was going on in your heart and your mind? Like what kind of feelings did you have? Yeah. So I thought about it long and hard before I actually ripped that bandaid off. Um, it was a really hard conversation with my manager because I had a great boss. I've had great managers in the past at that organization. Um, it was part of my fabric. <laughs> That was such a game-changing opportunity for me. I have lifelong friends from that opportunity. So um, my friends from outside of LinkedIn were like, are you nuts? What are you doing? This is like a great job. Like, why are you doing this? You cannot quit that job, Anne. So had the conversation with my manager, turned in my laptop and my key card, you know, took the elevator in our beautiful building that was in Chicago down to the parking garage to hop in my car to drive back to Michigan. And I called my husband and I think I said to him, Paul, I screwed up. Like, what did I do? And he's like, babe, no, you didn't. You've been thinking about this forever. You know, you've been working towards this goal. You finally achieved it. But it is scary because I walked away from, you know, amazing benefits, paycheck every two weeks. You know, my whole life, my whole professional career, my I, part of my identity was that. So you just really have to believe in yourself and you have to listen to your gut. That's something else I've learned as I've matured that the times I haven't listened to my gut in life has been a mistake. So for the younger folks out there, listen to your gut because that matters. Um, and I, I just knew I was making the right decision even though everyone told me I was crazy. I knew in my heart and in my gut I was making the right decision. So it was nothing against my organization. I will always bleed LinkedIn blue. It was just that it was time for me to take that next step in the chapter of, of, of my career. Why did you go the partnership route versus do it solo? Um, because I was scared, honestly. Yeah. So I had friends who wanted the same things that I did and wanted the same exit strategy. And we all felt the same way. You know, again, we, we had these great jobs in corporate America, making great money. But, you know, how are we going to replace that? In franchising, we knew we could do it, but it was easier to go in it together than to go solo. Yeah. So that's why I started out um, on that path with partners. Yeah. Do you think, um, from a sales standpoint, I think sometimes partnerships are nice because, well, partnerships can be tough and confusing and difficult. I've been part of that, or and and it may not even be those words that I just used to describe it just may be, there just may be conflict. And mm -hmm. we've had conflict in partnerships that I've yep. had when it comes time to sell a business. Some yes. may want to sell, some may not want to sell, some yes. may be adamant about it and can prevent a sale. Mm -hmm. um, but also at the same time, um, there's opportunity to sell to your partner. And, right. and and to and and just like in franchising, you could sell to another franchisee, which makes it it's really kind of nice that way. Or you can expand and you can be that buyer by buying out other uh, franchisees. Uh -huh. But looking back, was that the right thing to do? Is bring in a partner and eventually, you know, have that sale to that partner? Is like, would you have changed much with that? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change that at all. So that definitely worked out for me. Um, there was a lot of things at play with my previous partner that I had with EWC at the time when we got into it. I was living in Illinois. Um, when I sold, I was living in Michigan. So as you mentioned, you know, people mm -hmm. go in different directions. Um, they have ideas and thoughts about different things. And so nothing bad had occurred. We were just going down different paths. So no different than sometimes marriages don't work out. And so this was one of those things where we were going in a different direction um, he was very interested in, in purchasing um, my shares, and it worked out beautifully. Yeah, I like it when that when that happens. So, 
my salon suites. Do you have a partner in that? I think you said you- I do. I do. Yes. One of my girlfriends. So she also exited corporate America at the same time for the same reasons I did. So this was our, you know, our next play. What advice would you give the listeners? And this will be pretty much the last question. What advice would you give listeners around partnerships? Like what, what has worked great? What maybe hasn't worked for so great or just general advice based on your experience? So you definitely have to be authentic with your partner. You oh. definitely have to be able to have difficult conversations, even if it's something that's extremely uncomfortable. Uh, and again, you have to have compassion when you're having conversations like these that are difficult with your partners or really anyone in life. We're really truly understanding where that other person's coming from. And then um, working out a solve that's going to work for for both. It's not all about what you want. Sometimes it's, you know, what both people want. I think that's great advice. I think that's an area that I've grown in multiple partnerships that I've had. And I've been able to mentor other people in partnerships that are newer to partnerships that come into a partnership with me is just being able to understand someone else's side of the story. And mm-hmm. I and I had great partners that helped me understand that about our other partners. They're like, Eric, this is why they're saying this. This is what they're thinking. This is where this is their perspective. And this is why we think this. So, you know, early on in partnerships, it really helped me uh, take a step back, not get emotional, but yes. really start to understand why do they see it from this perspective? Why do I see it from this other perspective? And what's the middle ground? And how can we how can we work together for a resolution or a or or something that is going to work out for everybody? So, absolutely, that's bit. I, I echo that for sure. Great. All right. What else? Anything else that you want to uh, leave the audience with? Since, you know, I mean, you're not a podcaster. You don't get on these things. You're not doing this all day long like a lot of my guests. And this is my first one, but again, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Oh, um, it's good. been great learning from everyone that you've had on the podcast. Um, certainly, I am into GoGo because of listening to you and Mel's podcast. So, this is an incredible, incredible group of people that you've created and that you allow everyone to have access to. So thanks to you and the community that you've created. Well, thank you. Um, I think if uh, people, there's not many to validate with over at GoGlo because things are just getting started over there. Um, and But more franchisees are coming on board um, already. Somebody else that has EWC in their background. And then we have some, <laughs> we have some others that are that uh, just finished discovery day. So, um, or confirmation day to be a little bit more accurate. Um, So my point in all that is you'll probably be validating with some people that have actually listened to this at some point in the process. So get ready. They'll already feel like they know you because they've spent an hour with you uh, on the podcast, but I appreciate you coming on. I think it'd be fun just to kind of, you know, maybe do a follow-up in a year, see how things are going. And, um, you know, in all of your brands, because, You'll probably exit my salon suite at some point or have some type of either expansion or stabilization, or maybe you go into a growth mode and the same with GoGlo. And, you know, I think it's interesting following uh, people like yourself and, and their journey. So I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Franchise Secrets podcast. Links to everything can be found over at FranchiseSecrets.com. And if you want my help with anything from starting your own franchise to growing your current franchise business, please visit scalablefranchise.com.